Okay, welcome. And thank you for joining the Adroit Journal as we kick off the celebration of our 10th anniversary. I'm Heidi Seaborn. I'm Adroit's executive editor. And tonight we have an amazing lineup of talent from the archives of Adroit. Um, we're gonna ask everyone, we will mute you. We're gonna ask that you stay muted. But at the end, please, uh, we're gonna unmute you and go crazy. Um, I think we all need to hear some noise. Um, and so I ask you to, to join in and be loud at the end. So 10 years ago, Peter LaBerge was a 15 year old kid with a dream. <laughs> and the dream was to start a literary journal that was focused on the future, to foster emergent talent and showcase cutting edge work from established writers. From our inception in a teenager's bedroom, the Adroit Journal today attracts 100, uh, excuse me, attracts 15,000 submissions a year and millions and millions of readers. We've grown to a staff of well over 100 volunteers and Peter has grown up too. He's the author of two chapbooks, Makeshift Cathedral from Yes Yes Books and Hook from Sibling Rivalry Press. He received a 2020 Pushcart Prize and his work has appeared in Agni, Best New Poets, Crazy Horse, New England Review, Pleiades, and Tin House, among others. Peter's currently an MFA candidate and Writers in the Public Schools Fellow at NYU. I would like to raise a glass in appreciation to my friend and my boss, Peter LaBerge, to Peter. Cheers. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who, uh, who has joined us tonight. I'm really, really, really excited, um, especially to you know, our, our amazing readers and uh, our lineup. I'm just, I'm really excited to hear everyone. And it's so amazing to have you know, um, recent contributors joined by contributors in the first issue. Um, joined by you know so many contributors in between, um, it's it's really it's it's a surreal moment. <laughs> um, so, I I've been thinking a lot this week about why I started the journal and sort of where I was in my life when I did. Um, I was like Heidi said, I was 15. Um, I was really frustrated. I was sort of confused about how how to be a writer. <laughs> um, I was sort of, I was reaching out to poets and writers that I admired, um, asking, you know, questions that I don't really think had answers, or at least, I guess, no answers in sight. Um, you know, like, what does it mean to be a poet? What is it, when am I allowed to identify as a writer? And what do you have to do in order to identify as a writer? Is there a moment when you suddenly just know who you are and know sort of what you're supposed to be? Um, these I, I think are questions I couldn't answer at the time. Um, and I started Adroit, not because I necessarily wanted answers, but I think because I didn't want to wait around to find out what they were. <laughs> um, I think it's it's interesting, um, in, a, in a world that loves to encourage students to pursue STEM areas, I really, craved a similar support network for teen artists and writers. Um, and when I really looked at sort of, I looked at the, the sort of opportunities that I was presented with as a teen writer, and I just had to wonder like, where, where was the space for um, teen writers in the, in the, you know, in the literary world? Um, where was that space for writers trying to process and embark on their passion to write? And so um, I really just felt like all emerging writers, especially those, I think, with no sort of intrinsic writing communities in their schools or local communities, should be able to discover and explore the world of writing with like-minded peers before they decide whether to pursue writing um, or whether to not. <laughs> so. Uh, so this is the mindset, effectively, that I decided to found the Adroit Journal with um, 10 years ago. And it's also the mindset with which I think I, I reflect on the collective achievements uh, that we're here celebrating this evening. Um, since inception, 
cue humble bragging. <laughs> Since inception, we've reached uh, we've reached eighty thousand submissions of writing and art. We've been featured from the New York Times to the Paris Review to NPR to Teen Vogue to the New Yorker and beyond. Uh, work from our pages has appeared in Best American Poetry, the Pushcart Prize Anthology, Best New Poets, Best of Net, Poetry Daily, and so many more. Um, but what I'm most proud of are the resources and community that we've created for emerging writers. Um, our annual summer mentorship program, which has supported nearly 400 high school writers since its inception in 2013. Uh, the Adroit Prizes for Poetry and Prose, which recognize exceptional student writing at the high school and undergraduate uh, levels, and the Gregory Janikian Scholars and Poetry Opportunity, which recognizes and awards scholarships to six poets who haven't yet published full-length collections. Um, we, we really began by supporting emerging writers, by featuring them alongside established writers in our publications, and we've arrived here uh, with those resources and with events like this. And I'm, I'm proud that through it all, um, commitment to emerging writers has really been at the center of what we do. Um, many of you, I, I know, I just let most of you in. <laughs> many of you here tonight have played a significant role in, in making that community flourish and in making the publication and mentorship that we do possible. Um, whether you're a submitter, a staff reader, a contributor to one or more issues, a mentor, a mentee uh, from our summer mentorship program, an adroit prizes student, or a, J a Janikian scholar, um, which, by the way, you might have seen the email. We are currently open to submissions. Shameless plug. We'd love to see submissions from all of you. Uh, we're open through December 18th. Um, more info on our website. <laughs> so regardless of how you are involved with us, um, I am incredibly grateful to each each one of you for uh for helping to make a joy what it is today and uh for inspiring what it's going to be tomorrow so with that i will hand it back to heidi uh who will introduce our first reader of the evening dorian locks from our first issue and i just need to make sure that dorian has gotten in because we she was struggling with the link so Ooh. Hello? Ah, yay, Dorian's in. Dorian, let me, let me first introduce you. Okay. Ah, thank you, Peter. And you probably don't need to be introduced to Dorian, but I'm going to introduce her anyway. Her sixth collection, Only As the Day Is Long, New and Selected Poems, was named a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Her fifth collection, the, Men, the Book of Men, was awarded the Patterson Prize. Her fourth book of poems, Facts About the Moon, won the Oregon Book Award. And so it goes with Dorianne, Books and Prizes. She's also the co-author of the celebrated text, The Poet's Companion, A Guide to the Pleasures of Writing Poetry. Thank you, thank you, Dorianne, for being here tonight. Thank you. I just finally found myself. I didn't even know if I was on with you, but now that I do know, hello, everyone. Hello, Peter. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for publishing my poems. And, uh, and I thought I would uh, read my couple of poems that are in Adroit, um, just in case anyone hasn't uh, cracked issue one, you can go back to issue one and read this poem uh, there called Baptism. I was never baptized, never dunked under the metallic water and pulled back, gulping air like a salmon, my limp body cascading from a minister's bare arms. I do remember a Bible open on the dais, its calloused leather cover the drone of the pedal organ, my mother's hands barking on the keys, her bony knees. I remember the hymns, the glassy sea, the three-person God, doxology, the from whom, the heavenly host. We wore our white sneakers to church in summer. In winter, my brother wore his wide whale corduroy pants. Our mother, her string of pearls and steel blue dress, flocked with Swiss dots, her removable lace collar. She couldn't decide. First, she was Catholic, then we were Methodists, then Unitarians. She didn't believe, and then she did. 
I don't know what happened to change her mind so many times. After there were lemons and thunder, sometimes a barbecue, and one day we heard the word agnostic, then atheist, then arguments and the breaking of dinner plates, then nothing for a long time. Though she continued to play the hymns and we hummed along, the idea of God, a fading concept, something we began to unknow as the song unwound from the words like smoke, formless, worlds without end. And then I had uh, set up to read uh, my other poem, thank you, from um, Adroit. And uh, but because of all the snafu, I can't find it now. So um, <laughs> I'm just instead gonna read another poem about my mother. The, uh, the New and Selected has 20 new poems about my mother and uh, uh, she died recently. Um, and so, of course, I had written many poems about her, but she's always been my muse, and I've written poems about her throughout all of my books. And, but this is a brand new one that, of course, could have gone into the new and selected, but I wrote it too late. Uh, <clears throat> but it's called Singer, and for those of you who aren't too young, I don't know how many out there are our little babies. We've got a lot of baby faces, so you might not remember, but when I was young, we had Singer sewing machines in our living rooms, and um, we would sew. All of us sewed. We sewed our own dresses. I got good at sewing hats and lampshades, and, um, and so that was a fixture in our house, and this is called Singer. If I could go back to the living room window of my childhood house, Look again through the pane. It would be a telescope lens through which I might see the first woman I ever met, my mother at her sewing machine, rewinding the bobbin, little spool with holes like an old movie reel our tiny lives spun inside of. I might see her long piano fingers touch the balance wheel, the throat plate, the presser bar, one bare foot working the treadle, her heel revealing only the first three letters in black latticed metal, sin. My mother was what some called a sinful woman, divorced, pregnant without a husband, a baby boy given up for adoption, remarried, another baby born of another man, a one night stand while her husband was away at war. She drank too much thought too much, laughed with her head thrown back, danced with anyone. Too pretty, too brainy, too tall, her black hair a snare that hooked men in. But right now, she's fully visible, stretching the fabric for a kitchen curtain, a child's dress, swatches she salvaged from the deep sail bins, using the selvage for a hem, thereby cutting her handiwork by half the black oiled mechanism banging out dress after dress, tablecloths and runners, nothing she couldn't cobble together from the waist of others. She was a very particular, peculiar mother, and by now you can see why we loved her. She was a lit fuse in the rain. She turned from her work and set those same fingers on the piano keys and pulled music through the air. Making something from nothing was what she was good at. Love, children, shorts and t-shirts to dress them in. A table covered with cherries on which the beautiful food appeared. Roses from her front yard garden in an old cracked vase. Her long arms around our shoulders saying, sit still, eat, try not to spill anything. <clears throat> um, and uh, I'll end with this little poem, new poem, uh, called Bedtime Stories, which I don't know how many of you have seen it, but if you haven't, it's a great show. You should check it out, binge watch it. It's on History Channel, and it's called Ancient Aliens, my favorite of all. Bedtime Stories. I like falling asleep 
to ancient aliens, watching those flickering X-file lights tessellating through the forest, the glowing discs, triangles, and long metal lozenges, the three basic shapes of UFOs caught on cameras and wobbly videos. I love the secret of the pyramids, how the man in a lab coat, scientist of renown, asks how the heck did they do it? What kind of celestial saw did they use? How did they transport them from one island to another? What kind of angels are carved into the chapels of massive stone? I like listening to the hum of space gears and distant stars, like tinnitus in a tin cup the sand turned to glass where the ship touched down on their rotating bands of turquoise lights. I love the childlike drawings of those who've been abducted, the ovoid heads on spider-like bodies, their eyes translucent capsules of vitamin B12. Mouthless, earless, sexless creatures tasked with human examination prodding and pulsing above the darkly vaginal ones, the flowering penises that must confound them as much as they confound us, bathed in a shower of curiosity and confusion beneath the incandescent dome. Episode after episode, they arrive and depart, each show more impossible and vaguely probable than the last, until the night finally takes me into the sweet release of sleep, and I doze off in the TV's cathode beam, its glimmer and glint, its gleam and flare, as I fall up into space, made of nothing but light and time, formless and flailing, an alien to my waking life. Thank you, Dorianne. Wow, it's amazing. Thank you. And also from our first issue, I'd like to introduce Laura Kaziski. She teaches at the MFA program at the University of Michigan. She's the author of seven poetry collections, including Space and Chains, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Where Now. Kaziski also won the Juniper Prize, the Beatrice Howley Award, the Alice Faye Discot <laughs> De Castelga Award, the Bobst Award for Emerging Writers, and the Rilke Poetry Prize, and several Pushcart Prizes, as well as fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. I'd like to welcome Laura. Laura? Thank you. Can you see and hear me? I'm afraid our, can you see me? Yep, you're good. Are you able to see me? Or hear me? We can hear you. Oop. And there we go. Am I good? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm really sorry. You can, can you see me? Yes. You can see me too. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we bought we bought into the contract for the cut rate Wi-Fi before we knew our lives would depend on it. We're out in the country, but I'm viewable and hearable. You're all good. Um, yep. Okay. All right. So I should start reading. Okay. I'm really honored to have been a part of adroit from the get-go and um, I love it since then and I'm so impressed by Peter of course and by Heidi and um, honored to have been asked to read with such company and so I'll start with a poem that was um, first accepted by adroit and um, which I'm going to include I in a new book of poems, I hope, is coming out pretty soon, and it's called No Elegy. No, no elegy. Instead, the car stalled on the freeway, the passengers departed, and the driver fled. 
the driver who is my friend who wanted once and was who dreamed and drove and listened to stupid music on the radio who waited who ate who spoke and spent and finally arrived at the foreign country that bore his name. And of all the choices he ever made, there were three choices left. Violence, illness, old age. No, no choice. You refused, of course, to make it. Sailboat slipping under a wave. You swam away. Or you were rescued by a boat captained by sorrowful ladies of a certain age who would love you as you'd never been loved enough in life, as mothers or lovers or the slow passing of certain summer days, their parasols, your shade, and my little candle stub in a great cathedral and the prayers I sometimes remember to say and the long, low, beautiful notes of a bassoon being played by a terrible thing. No, not even this. I know, a bird. A bird that makes its nest in the highest towers of the children's hospital, out of the softest children's hair. You love nothing better than a lovely terror. Yes, that nest, that nest is where you are. Thank you for accepting that poem and for reaching out to me and for including me in such august company. And uh, this is a newer poem and it's for my son, Jack, who um, is in Scotland and uh, uh, seems very far away now. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean seems far vaster than it used to when we could get on planes. Um, so it's filled with facts and it ends with um, a quote from a Scottish murder ballad. Um, but, uh, the line is not about that. The lines refer to a country that I would say is our country, not the country he's in perhaps. And it's called Facts for Jack. The housefly hums in the middle octave key of F. It's a fact actually. The average tongue of a blue whale weighs more than an average elephant. Thornton's nightingale kept a small owl in her pocket. A bear has 42 teeth. Gerda could only write poetry when he had a rotten apple in his desk drawer. It's against the law in Kansas to catch a fish with your hands. After he was stabbed, the last words Caligula said were, I'm not dead. And all the adjectives in the English language also the flutter of the tiny fins of the miniature blue fish in the aquarium in the waiting room of the dentist's office. Saints, particularly the celibate and female, always hide their eyes from his radiance. At least they hide their eyes the first time. We don't know what they do after that. The, the human soul has whiskers longer than a cat's. A cat's soul is a cloud full of claws. The slowest is always the first, young or old, sober or drunk, rich or poor, always. When you raise your arms to surrender to the police, your shadow is briefly Jesus behind you, but you can't see this. Some words must never be separated, such as blithe indifference, blunt force trauma, formless fruit. A, shot, a shoe is tied by its laces to a branch of that tree. A soggy Kleenex has been stuffed behind the hymnal in the pocket of this pew. Sewer grates, look down, you'll see, abandoned libraries beneath every city. Google it. There's something called simple harmonic motion. I don't know what it means, but my guess is it has to do with vibration, repetition, elasticity. Hooke's Law. Now, that's an actual thing. It means that you can pull a spring too tightly, I think, and you'll be sorry then. F equals minus KX. Some numbers are all you needed. I love you. Hurry, but don't rush to the exit like everybody else, or you'll be trampled too. The pandemonium, the stampede, the glossy green leaves of orange trees, 
Every single needle on this pine tree has been shined today by the sun. The rubber soles of athletic shoes, the steel toes of work boots. Forget your possessions, leave them. Nothing belongs to anyone now. Just crouch in a corner or slip through the door that no one but you knows is hidden, but is also wide open. That's where I'll meet you. That's where I'll wait. You'll know how to find me because I'll be singing that song we heard the drunk guy sing on the bus that day. The last lines of which, please let me remind you whether you've forgotten them or not, were these. And all the blood that's shed on earth runs through the streams of that country. And then I'll end um, with this poem, but again, with gratitude. Um, and I'm excited to hear um, everyone else. It's called Two Gardens. It's in two parts. I thought that was kind of brilliant. Two gardens. Two. <laughs> well, anyway, so two gardens, one. In this one, the great man's statue lies face down in the grass, some butterflies. In that one, a dish made out of bones sliced so thin that Held to the sun, it disappears, since you can't hold a circle of light in your hand. In the mud between these gardens, there are boot prints, but crossing the boundaries freely, too, there are hundreds of long-necked birds, pink feathered, sipping honey out of the hundreds of jars left out for them, too. In one garden, this could be a generous impulse. In that garden, it could be a trap. Someone is a bird watcher in this one. Someone makes ladies feathered hats in that. But it's hard to tell the gardens apart from such a distance. Still, there's definitely a fence between them and the white slats of it appear to be painted with rosebuds from over here. Although from over there, those roses look like the small red handprints of children who came to this garden before us and bled. Thank you so much for having me here and listening. Thank you, Laura. I am so grateful that your Wi-Fi held out. It was wonderful. Now I'm going to skip ahead to issue 14. Tiana Clark is the author of the poetry collection, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, which won the, the 2017 Agnes Lynch Starrett Prize. And She's also a Frost Place Chapbook Prize winner for her chapbook, Equilibrium. Tiana has won numerous other prizes, including the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, a Pushcart Prize, the Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial Poetry Prize, and the Rattle Poetry Prize. Tiana has, been, has received the National Endowment of Arts Fellowship and the Ruth Halls Poetry Fellowship, amongst others. She teaches creative writing at Southern Illinois University. Welcome, Tiana. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Can you all hear me all right? Wonderful. Um, I just dropped a Google Doc to my poems if you need to read along in the chat. Um, thank you so much to Peter. Thank you so much to Adroit. This is such an honor. I'm full of gratitude and to read with this dream lineup with all of um, so many poets that I love and admire so much. Um, thank you all so much. I'm going to read two poems tonight. Um, this first poem is called Broken Ode for the Epigraph. Um, so, all my epigraph lovers, shout out in the chat. I was told in my grad school. I need to calm down on epigraphs. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna write a poem, just loving them so much. Um, also, I just wanna say it meant so much to me to have a poem and a joy. I think I got uh, my first poem when I was in my MFA. And uh, it meant so much to me because I just love the aesthetics and it, I love so much that was available online. And I think that you all do just a great job of kind of democratizing the access to literature in such a really funky, fun way. So, broken note for the epigraph. And it starts with an epigraph from Erica L. Sanchez, which reads, who gave me permission to be this person? Oh, intertextuality, oh, little foyer to my poem, oh, little first and foremost, my amuse-bouche, meaning mouth amuser, a little glimpse of the meal to come. And if I could, I would add an epigraph over everything. Wait, who says I can't? I've always been too much, and I'm just now beginning to cherish this too muchness, booming late Baroque Rococo in my chest, little shells of scattered light decorating the caves in my poems. I wish people came with little epigraphs tacked on their foreheads, a little foreshadow couldn't hurt. I wish fruits had a few ripe lines above their plu numbers, a little sneaky peaky of the pulp to come. 
a little cup holder for my co quotes. I love how you hover over the house of my poem, like a cloud from another book or a bite from another lover, a way to say, I just couldn't help myself here. See, I cut out these lines for you like fuzzy flower stems severed at an angle, and they were briefly dead until I placed them in a vase on top of my poem with prolonging their life again, such moxie. Because of anything, the epigraph is a little clay container of water, and I place these blossoms in a vase of life juice because you're visiting the home of my poem, and I want you to feel special, and I think fresh cut flowers might people might make people feel sacriferous. At least they do for me, especially when my mother-in-law walks barefoot into her gorgeous garden and snips the long lit stems from the sun bursting Persephia bush, even though we haven't talked in months, even though I wrote a poem about her that hurt her, a poem that started with an epigraph from Natasha Trethaway. And we talked about it over email and then over coffee and then there was forgiveness, both sides, and that was it, see the flowers. I've always deeply loved Natasha Trethaway's work because her parents are like my parents, black mom, white dad, another type of epigraph, right? Do you understand what kind of permission that releases inside of me? Do you understand how cellular and specific? Sometimes it's important to know about the blood before the poem starts. Who makes up these rules about procedure anyway? I come from clutter. I feel safe under that little liminal space below the title, underneath the stairs, and before that first line. Toy Derricott writes, I am not afraid to be memoir. Yes, I feel such great affection for Toy Derricott because she has a similar first name as my grandmother, but spelled differently. And also because she drew her beloved dead fish, Telly, in my copy of The Undertaker's Daughter, writing, Telly loves you, with the bubbles and everything. Well, then I'm not afraid to be the ep epigraph, damn it. I'm joyfully trying to break every rule about poem making that I know. I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more. I want to wake up and like myself more and believe it each time I repeat it. I want to revel in my poems the way Danica Kelly does. Have you heard Danica talk about poems? Do it. Absolute pleasure. I want more of that giddy precision. I want to wake up and address myself like the badass motherfucking epigraph that I am. Hello, epigraph! I am beginning my body before my body begins. I want to start my day with somebody else's words. For example, this morning, I started with Ross Gay's The Book of Delights, and I keep grinning at underlining words like delight radar and delight muscle and that image of stacking delights like pancakes. And I can hear Ross's voice as I read them. His joyous timber almost sings shouting inside these smile-inducing sentences, which linger over the blue length of my day. And I just got back from AWP in Portland, where I heard Jose Oliveras say lean into length on a panel about poetry podcasts. I wrote it down, and underneath his words scribbled, possible epigraph? Epigraph, a little floor play, a little playful forest. I'm safe now so I can play. A little forecast of my mood and tone, a little incantation, little wordy satellites in the white spaces orbiting the sky parlor of my poems. Epigraph, my father. Epigraph, my father I've never met but how I meet him and let him go at the beginning of every poem that I write. And isn't lost perpetually dripping sap from the injured trees bruised or cut in our knuckles as we write. Sticky sap spilling from the wound, pitching to survive the bites. And aren't we all writing the same damn poem over and over again anyway? Didn't Jack Spicer allude to that once by transiting Lorca? I want to go back to that first epigraph. The easy association would be God, right? Like this. So God coos above the waters of the pre-world, scanning over all that gooey potential, a bajillion possibilities, millions of us already there, little epigraphs in the making gleaming in that first sentence struck light, the imperative big bang of God's never ending breath. But, but what if that first epigraph wasn't so spectacular? What if it was just someone messaging me on one of those spit in a tube DNA ancestry sites, saying that they're my second cousin, saying that they know how to get in touch with my dad, saying that they gave him my number and my email address, saying they told him I didn't want or needed any money, but how he still never reached out. I had to read that for the shout out to Jose. So. Um, this is called Scorched Earth. Uh, it's uh, an acrostic poem off of a Kara Walker piece um, that I'm gonna drop in the chat if you wanna look at it. Um, uh, and it's off of a uh, a silhouette that she put over um, a Harper's pictorial image um, of Buzzard's Roost Pass of a Civil War picture. Um, thank you so much. Scorched Earth. Black breasts split within a Civil War battlescape. Black breasts hewn and hacked off like discs of licorice. Butter padded over a field of white men at war. 
Sherman's army penetrating Georgia, Sherman marching to Savannah, not giving a shit about slaves. Does anyone know where a black woman is and is not the linguistics of a landscape, raped, mastered, controlled, conquered, hoed, mined, fucked? Kara, why did you cut her up like that? Kara, you be knowing how the blacky body becomes and is becoming the violent earthwork of shadow and fissure such discrepancy of ink. And I'm looking at your black silk screen, thinking about the beginning of Paul Ceylon's death fugue. Black milk of morning, we drink you at dusk time, we drink you at noon time and dawn time, we drink you at night, we drink and drink, we scoop out a grave in the sky where it's roomy to lie. Kara, have you read this poem, Kara? What about that torn forearm above the frame reaching back in the negative space, her head stippled with cannon bursts, cut flower bombs piercing the profile, dead silhouette. Kara, would you still not answer me if I asked you about longing, about your process? I get so tired when people ask me about this one poem that I wrote. The truth is I lied. Did I have to be there for it to still hurt me? Am I allowed to conjure the possibility of pain to protect myself from the pain? Imagine the shape of my trauma like blacker breasts pointing in different directions across the gorge of my partly disembodied body. Did it have to happen for it to be true? The truth is I felt like I heard it. The truth is I still pull away from my lover in public. That's my real life. I don't trust affection. I don't know who's looking and not looking at me. I don't know who's going to read this either, but I want them to like me. Kara, I want you to like me. For that to happen, should the poem end with my hand reaching for you too? Should the poem end with you touching my black breasts? Oops, I mean beast, sorry. Oh, sorry for saying sorry so much. Do you still wanna to touch my blackest breast after I've apologized? And let's say I keep apologizing and then I make this mistake again. Will you still want to touch me? Do you want? to see me touch me. Sometimes I touch myself because I don't know if I exist. Once a white guy in high school asked to see my brown beauties, kissed my chest for hours. I don't want, I didn't want to do it, but I did it and I've done that so many times. Does that make my breasts powerful or fierce or political or, or is there anything new they want to say about the art of black femmes? If so, will you say it now? I'm exhausted and bored of the list of lazy adjectives. Say something new and then shoot me in the face three times or better yet, hang me in my own cell and say I did it. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Do it. Do it. No one will believe that I was murdered. Do it. Kill me. No one ever trusts a black woman's mouth. Kara, what that mouth do when that lithograph stuck in a inside a locked room? Singing stratted cumulus clouds. I guess the weather is about to change. Oh, I see one fang in her mouth. I got sharp teeth like that too. I leave a bark when I bite myself. I draw black blood and paint myself. My black bitch head over my black bitch history. When I was little, I prayed to God for big old breasts, but they never came. Instead, I've got massive areolas that I've just now stopped being ashamed of. It's important to be specific when you ask God to win the war or who's gonna win the war, or rather which side's gonna win the war. All the same when the war has always been your body. I love my black breasts. I love my black breasts. I love my black breasts. Thank you, Tiana. That was amazing and very, very powerful. I'd like to, um, now introduce Chen Chen, who first appeared in issue 16. He's the author of When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities, which was long listed for the National Book Award and won the Tom Gunn Award, among other honors. His work appears in many publications, including Poetry, Plowshares, The New York Times, and The Best American Poetry. He received a Pushcart Prize and fellowships from Kuhneman and the National Endowment of the Arts. He teaches at Brandeis University. Welcome, Chin Chin. Hello. Um, oh my God, such an honor to be here um, and to follow Tiana. Oh my God, those poems, so good. Um, actually, I wrote a whole essay in grad school after, um, I, a workshop instructor had said like don't use epigraphs and I was like no <laughs> um, so I wrote a whole essay about the the power and the beauty of epigraphs so it's just so great to hear that poem love that poem um, okay so I'll read two poems so this first one um, an older version of this uh, appeared in uh, Adroit um, just that publication that early encouragement you know before I had a book and then this poem ended up in this book. Um, just so beautiful uh, to be here. This is called Nature Poem. The birds insist on pecking the wooded dark. The wooded dark pecks back. It is time to show the universe what you are capable of, says my horoscope, increasingly insistent this month. 
But what I'm capable of is staring at the salt accident on the coffee table and thinking, what sad salt. I admire my horoscope for its conviction. I envy its consistency. Every day, every day, there's a future to be aggressively vaguer about. Earlier today, outside the cabin, the sudden deer were a supreme headache of beauty. Don't they know I am trying to be alone and at peace? In theory, I am alone, and really I am hidden, which is a fine temporary substitute for peace, except I still have email, which is how I receive my horoscope. And even here in the wooded dark, I receive yet another email mistaking me for another Chen. I add this to a folder, which also includes emails sent to my address, but addressed to Chang, Chen, Chang. Once in a Starbucks, the cashier was convinced I was Chad. Once in a Starbucks, the cashier did not quite finish the N on my Chen. And when my tall mocha was ready, they called out for share. I preferred this by far, but began to think the problem was Starbucks. Why can't you see me? Why can't I stop needing you to see me? For someone who looks like you to look at me, even as the coffee accident is happening to my second favorite shirt. In my wooded dark, I try insisting on a supremely tall, never lonely someone. But every kind of someone needs someone else to insist with. I need, if not the you I have memorized and recited and mistaken for the universe, another you. Um, so this other poem is newer, pretty new. Um, and I guess I'll just say, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, the mentorship program, which was such a joy to uh, teach and to be a part of. Um, just the talent, oh my God, these young writers. Uh, so this, this poem is dedicated to, to those young writers. This is called The School of You. Suppose you live a long life full of blueberries and jade blazers and dreams of ice skating in the nude and ice skating in the nude. So briskly frisky, a life longer than you planned to live toward you, who was told at 13 to die that you would soon, a silly faggot and not even a white one, just a brief, brief filth, not worth the spit to wipe away. At 13, you knew you wouldn't last forever. Still, you were given little reason to believe you might last another decade, another. How already you were supposed to be not. And yes, I'm talking to myself, saying suppose otherwise. Suppose a life so long and gorgeously silly, viewers will complain about everything left out from your biopic, which will star an actor so handsome, every audience member will gasp in unison upon, upon first seeing him on screen. But despite that, yes, the fans will cry. Not enough about that time he robbed a crepery. Not enough about his years spent painting hippos. Not enough about how that involved both paintings of and paintings on hippos and how long it took him to realize he was not very good at painting, then realizing finally that it didn't matter, so long as his very handsome fingers spent all those many years dreaming with paint. And why do only successes get to be smashing? Why not a smashing failure? Yes, I am talking to myself as though it is my birthday, and this is my gift, telling myself what I was never told, Suppose in one part of your still three hour long biopic, it is your 88th birthday. All day you exclaim, I'm 88. At your birthday, I'm 88. To every friend and fellow 80 something silly faggot. You are wearing someone's worst nightmare and you are who wore it best. And then the cake, not 88 candles, but still a ridiculous number, flames and flames. Suppose you blow them out, wishing for more blazing, more you. Suppose you know already, there will be. Thank you. Wow, it was so beautifully read. Thank you so much. Um, and now from issue 21, 
Latanya McQueen is the author of the essay collection and it begins like this, which weaves together historical and ge genealogical research, folklore, biblical passages, literary theory and criticism and personal memory to examine the legacy of slavery and its relationship to black female identity in contemporary America. Her fiction and nonfiction has been published in Triquarterly, West Branch, Pleiades, the Arkansas International, the Florida Review, Black Warrior Review, and many, many other places. She received her MFA from Emerson College, her PhD from the University of Missouri, and was a Robert P. Dan Emerging Writer Fellow at Cornell College. Please welcome Latanya. Hi. Um, so my dog is throwing a tantrum, it seems, so you might, <laughs> you might hear him, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, I'm going to read an essay. Uh, Peter, Peter was one of the first to uh, publish uh, some of my essays and also to uh, publish me during a time when I was really struggling with both writing and whether or not I wanted to continue this. And so I'm really grateful, Peter, to you for, uh, for publishing me and for everything that you've done. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to do this while holding my dog, so forgive, forgive me. Um, this is called We Were Never Free. Once, my father told me how he had tried to plan his high school reunion. When he contacted all the white students, they refused to come, some even hanging up the phone when they heard his name. Each and every one still harbored resentment over the integration of their high school, still, after all these years, angry for the sake of it. I was young then, not fully understanding the depths of another person's hate. I looked at him, uncomprehending, and I asked why. Why do they care after all these years? Without hesitation, without even a blink of a pause, he looked at me and said, okay, but you forgot. Remember, we were once slaves. Remember, they gave us Bibles to make us believe our lot. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear they made us remember, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Remember that was the quote they used when they whipped us. Remember they jeered and smiled in photos as they stood in front of the burned remnants of our bodies. Remember they took pieces of us to keep. Remember any reason was enough to rope us by our necks. Remember sundown towns. Remember bloody Sunday. Remember segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Remember the acid poured in pools when they saw us swimming or the rocks thrown to make us drown. Remember red line Remember fighting against separate but equal, but only to be met with fire hoses and the police dogs sent for us. Remember Katrina. Remember how they spit on us sitting at lunch counters. Remember the murders of our heroes, of Malcolm, of Martin, of Medgar, and so many other lives stolen. Remember the Birmingham bombing. Remember the Charleston shooting. Remember the neighborhoods they kicked us out of, pushing us out further still, always pushing us further toward the edge of oblivion. So do you understand? Yet deep down, I knew had always known, like I understood how happy my mother was when they built the new middle school that because of redistricting, I would be able to attend. And my mother was happy because it was the white school. White meaning somehow to her that I would have a chance in this life. Never mind, I was one of the only black students in my classes. Never mind how that's how I would be in high school, in college, and also in graduate school. And never mind during all that time, I would feel as if I was on the periphery of my life, observing but never taking part, feeling both pride and a deep shit sense of shame for existing. How it always felt like a portrayal I couldn't quite identify. Not then, it would take me years to finally understand, years after reading white stories in white classrooms, of, reading, of re being taught by white teachers who favored white students, of living an entire life where I was made to feel invisible because of course I was invisible. I should have understood I never belonged in the first place, even though my mother tried so hard to make sure I was put in the spaces that had long been denied to us, to her. But what my mother never realized and what it took me forever to understand was the simple truth my father now was trying to tell me. We'll never be the same as them no matter what we do in this life, no matter how much we try. Do you get it now, he wanted to know. Do you finally get what I've been trying to make you see for all these long years? We were never really equal. We have never been free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a powerful reading that we will always remember. Thanks. I'd like to introduce Jose Oliveras, who appeared in issue 24. He's the son of Mexican immigrants 
His debut book of poems, Citizen Illegal, was a finalist for the Penn John, uh, Jean Stein Award and a winner of the Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize, along with Felicia Chavez and Willie Perdomo. He has co-edited the poetry anthology, The Breakbeats Poets, Latinx. Jose received the first annual Author and Artist in Justice Award from the Phillips Brooks House Association and was awarded a Ruth, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. He's the co-host of the poetry podcast, The Poetry Gods. Welcome, Jose. Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. I'm going to share a Google Doc with my poems for everyone uh, for anyone who might want to see them. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, really quickly, just want to say congratulations to everyone at Adroit, the whole staff. Congratulations, Peter and Heidi. Um, 10 years is a long time. That's beautiful. This poem is called, It's Only Day Whatever of the Quarantine, and I'm Already Daydreaming of Robbing Rich People. <laughs> I would like to punch Jeff Bezos in his stupid face, and I would like health care in case my hand bruises, and I would like to live long enough to hug my friends, to kiss my mom and dad on their foreheads and not worry about infecting them. I would like to live long enough to punch Jeff Bezos in his stupid face again. Is it stupid, stupid or not, I would like to punch it. What does that solve, you could ask? This isn't a good poem, you could say, and you're right, it's not a good poem. I don't have health care, I don't have health care, I don't have health care, there's no way to make that pretty. But let me try. When sirens brush by our block, I see cardinals and blue jays brawling. Their feathers tickle our buildings. All I hope is the ambulance leaves before my magic trick unfeathers itself and the sirens become sirens become sirens. If we stole a billion dollars from Jeff Bezos, he wouldn't even notice, so let's steal more. When sirens brush by our block, I don't see birds. I see bills, bills and coffins. And when I see coffins, I see all the debt that can't be buried with me. How even in death, my name will be a worm in an accountant spreadsheet. Cool. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and I'm so excited to be reading with all of these uh, lum luminaries. I hope I'm using that word correctly. This poem is called Poem Where No One Is Deported. Uh, and I wrote it because sometimes people like to use violence against migrant people as a plot point. So this is Poem Where No One Is Deported. Now I like to imagine La Migra running into the sock factory where my mom and her friends worked. It was all women who worked there, women who braided each other's hair during breaks, women who wore rosaries and never had a hair out of place, women who were ready for cameras or for God, who ended all their sentences with, si Dios quiere, as in the day before the immigration raid when the rumor of a raid was passed around like bread and the women made plans, si Dios quiere. So when the immigration officers arrived, they found, they found boxes of socks and all the women absent, safe at home. Those officers thought no one was working. They were wrong. The women would say it was God working and it was God. But the God my mom taught us to fear was vengeful. He might have wet his thumb and wiped La Migra out of this world like a smudge on a mirror. This God was the God that woke me up at 7 a.m. every day for school to let me know there was food in the fridge for me and my brothers. I never asked my mom where the food came from, but she told me anyway. Gracias a Dios. Gracias a Dios de la comida. Gracias a Dios de las mujeres. Gracias a Dios del chisme, who heard all La Migra's plans and whispered them into the right ears to keep our family safe. Thank you, Adroit. Thank you, everybody. 
Thank you so much, Jose. And by the way, we have a beautiful signed broadside for sale of Jose's poem, A Mexican Dreams of Heaven. Um, and I'll drop the link to that in the chat later. Also from issue 24, Kaming Chang. Kaming Chang was born in the year of the tiger. She is a Kundaman Fellow and a Lambda Literary Award finalist in poetry. Her debut novel, Bestiary will be published by One World this September, or has been published by One World, and is long listed for the, for the Center of Fiction First Novel Prize. Her poems have been anthologized in Ink Knows No Borders, Best New Poets, Bettering American Poetry, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. She was raised in California and now lives in New York. Welcome, Kimi. Hi, thank you so much um, for introducing me and I'm so honored <laughs> to be here. I'm like very nervous and, and giddy. Um, I'm gonna be reading a, a flash fiction piece um, and it, it's kind of inspired by like the urban legend that all my friends in elementary school and I were always talking about and obsessed with of like going to Wendy's and finding a finger in your bowl of chili and then getting like a huge amount of settlement money and my friends and I for some reason were like oh my god we just need to go and like cut off our fingers and like plant them in our food and we'll we'll make it like that's making it um and so this flash fiction piece came out of that a uh, finger we hear on tv that if you find a finger in your bowl of chili at wendy's you can sue them and live on that money forever we debate whose finger to sever how we will split the money but in the end, only one girl is willing. Gao Xiaotai, whose mother needs surgery to remove her spleen because it is hardening. What is the spleen, we ask Xiaotai, but she doesn't know either, can only make two fists and say this is inside her. We ask her which finger she wants to sacrifice, and she says her ring one, since she doesn't want to marry anyway. Her mother says men are worse than spleens because they can't be surgically removed from inside you. That's fine, we say, that we pity that finger, crying as we hold it down on her mother's cutting board and bring the cleaver down blunt. That we tied a knot around her finger the night before, choking off the blood so it will turn dead and white as a radish. Shall Tai still screams, and we are still sorry that the blade doesn't go all the way through, just sort of lodges in the bone. And by the time we wrestle the cleaver up again, her bone flaking like snow, Xiao Tai is unconscious and her mother is awake, chasing us out. Her finger is only severed part way and now it has an extra hinge in it. And though we think she looks cooler this way, like those ghosts with hands as long as their arms that can eat a tree with one fist, her mother is upset because Xiao Tai is unmarriageable now. Xiao Tai says she has to drink a bag of pig's blood every day because of blood loss. And because we are sorry, we buy her jumbo bags at Dahua and watch her sip her wrists bulging full, shattering her bracelets and scattering the bone beads we scramble to pluck off the shriek. We will find another thing to amputate, maybe a toe because who needs those? Xiao Tai says she has an uncle without toes and maybe we can ask him for advice. With all his toes sold, he must live in a house beneath his own acre of sky, rain whenever he wants it, the sun dinging like a concierge bell. But Xiao Tai says no, this uncle lives in his Subaru. We tell her we don't believe that, but Xiao Tai brings us to the Burger King parking lot and asks him to show us his feet. It's true, he says, I lost my toes, but not inside a stew. During the war, I was sent to Qinghai to herd cattle, and all the women said, remember to sleep with your feet buried in coal, and I forgot, and my toes purpled like grapes and were plucked off clean by the cold. But I kept my teeth, he says, smiling, and they are turrets of gold. Every part of him is gilded. Skin described by sweat, hands rubied with calluses. We tell him he should have kept all his toes in a baggie and tucked them into a cheeseburger, and then he'd be so rich, his bones would be re-released in gold. And he laughs and says they burned his toes, converted them to coals. We ask if he has collected them back yet. No, he says, and asks why we want them. We say we are going to spoon them to our mouths and scream and sue, and then we will pay to evict Xiao Tai's mother's spleen, and we will buy pink houses that look like sliced cake and holographic skirts and a new Subaru that can go underwater like a submarine and resurface him anywhere he wants. He laughs again. He says, does a finger cost so much here? 
When I was little, he says, little girls didn't roam the streets looking for cold toes, didn't hijack cleavers either. What do they do then, we ask, and he says they used to fly kites. Kites with faces on them to scare ghosts away, kites with our faces. Back then, he tells us, he had a sister just like us, except one time she got her kite tangled in a power line. When she tried to tug it down, she got electrocuted. They tried to take her home, but no one could touch her without snagging themselves in her light. And by the time she stopped shaking, she was dead. We had to carry her home without touching her, muffled in wool, he says. How much money did you get, we ask, for her whole body like that? We think it must be a lot, but he turns away from us, putting his hands on the wheel, even though we are going nowhere. Nothing, he says, nothing. That's when Xiao Tai gets the idea to dig up a dead body and steal the fingers off that. In this way, none of our blood has to be replaced with the pigs. We agree, and all week we dig beneath power lines for electrocuted girls, but we only find soda cans, pigeon bones, gravel. Xiao Tai's mother's belly turns green because the spleen is now a honeydew melon. And though Xiao Tai begs us to finish severing her finger, we see the way it hinges, knuckling like a tree beneath another country's wind, and we cannot fell it. Xiao Tai's uncle follows us in his car as we walk to Dahua for pig's blood, as we plot which bodies to rob, always our own. He scrolls down his window, his car stalls behind us, shuddering still, and the window breathes steam. Freeze, he says, you'll freeze. He runs out toward us, kneeling, taking each of our feet one at a time and cupping them in his palms, buttering us in his breath, and we ask him to go back in the car. Aren't you cold out here? Don't spend all your blood on us. But he kneels, holding our feet to his lips like a microphone, saying again and again, someday you will be worth more than this. You will be worth more than what you've lost. Thank you. Thank you. That was a beautiful reading and an amazing story. And now from issue 25, Justin Philip Reed, who is an American writer and amateur bass guitarist, and has preoccupations including horror cinema, poetic form, morphological transgressions, and the uses of the gross text. He is the author of two poetry collections, The Malevolent Volume, out this year, and Indecency, both published by Coffeehouse Press. Born and raised in the PD region of South Carolina, he participates in vague spirituality and alternative rock music cultures and enjoys smelling like outside. What a great <laughs> introduction to Justin Philip Reed. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Heidi. And um, thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you for inviting me and Droid to help celebrate 10 years. Um, this is quite quite a fun fun lineup. Um, so, in the spirit of uh, you know decennial celebrations, I decided I just wanted to revisit um, a few of my favorite horror movies from uh, the year 2010. Um, so, I decided to recover three of them um, and to write engagements with them specifically for this event. Um, so, I chose. Um, the films Insidious, Adam Green's Frozen, not to be confused with the Disney Frozen and uh, Black Swan. Um, but I think I'm gonna skip one because of time. Um, and I'm gonna try to share my screen so that y'all can follow along. All right, cool. Let's see if I can get that out of the way. All right, so this is for Adam Green's Frozen. The fuck is up with Sean Ashmore and Ice is also the fuck up with blue-eyed people and wolves. Ashmore has an identical twin. Caravaggio's Narcissus blends a, blends a blue knee. I think it's a knee. The root of Narcissus is possibly the Greek narke for numbness. See also a narcotic, a ski resort in sundown town, same time. Picnicking in the carnivore park, rosé root upon the powder, bones licked pure as the driven. White dads with blue eyes who work for endangered wolf centers hate this film and can't write black and killer cop poems, they go for poor. If you root for everybody black, don't worry. 
relaxed, sorry, quote, we don't, quote, do that Winter Olympics, except Sam Jackson in Deep Blue Sea, Harold Perrineau in The Edge, both dead. And on Saturday, I biked to RAI on the south side with a blue-eyed crush who speaks Patagonia, and he is 6'3", and associates unbearably helpful to him, as if even with his discount, they will make well enough off the myth that there's anywhere to go in the city of Pittsburgh. Who builds a metropolis in a trailer park? Can I see myself in anyone from up here? pissing to keep my eye, my legs alive in the air, falling in love the way tenebrism drags me kicking and screaming through winter. My eyes have adjusted to the illusion of set lighting. The drop is sheer and will crease my knees like earmarks. I'm right here. I never left to get help. I like his hand at my back in a $200 jacket. Don't fucking watch when it happens. I don't look long at the cheek of the youth, but am mesmerized by the blue he will lose to the pool. His flash of taboo, attainable only this eternal once, tyrannically swelling enigmatic over time. The carnage is warranted in Caravaggio. Brushstroke of a sun slope through the fibrous cirrus over and ergo inside silver hip of Monongahela, we pedal the hot metal bridge across and with fingertips stinging in my gloves, I wanted a hug. You do not distinguish between turning to face a self and turning against it. I want to be numb to the money in my name. Don't fucking come looking for it. I can't die where I don't even live. And um, this is for the film Black Swan. Black pink, cake nail, and camera dances it too. Lights again. Slender women in unison, specific as wicks in the center. Aronofsky, Tchaikovsky, and the crunch of feathered necks between boot heel and permafrost. Glass caught in the breathing gauze, the bleeding gauze, the seething audience. Aw to you, aw to you. In the beginning of The Rest of Love, Carl Phillips begins his custom with, there is a difference it used to make, seeing three swans in this versus four in that quadrant of sky. It's partially a footnote on disciplined study, attentive devotion as prison or road north. Pale princess of the quadrant of reticent labor versus dark mistress of violence and leisure. The camera dances to compensate for imperfection in both. Swan song, the black pink of vanities, electric daybreak, the specific splendor of sauntering waifs with cigarettes and Vincent Cassell. Y'all just be casting men like what the hell. When Nina leaps out of labor into freedom, her violence blossoms. Without drama, writes Phillips, what is ritual? The fingernail to Nina's skin is, Tomas's tongue in her mouth is, her mother at the keyhole is, Lily's face at her pelvis is, the something in her drink is, the nail file in Beth's face over and over is, the quill her rash surfaces is, the shard in her wound flexing over and over. What is ritual? For the intrusion of suitors in unison, for the 17 men who write, direct, and produce, for the mad queen painter who keeps her muse under lock and must be loved, cake and celebrate champagne for celebrations. The night again, the light again, the light it didn't happen, Nina leaping out of Nina, but touches herself by a hero plate, intimacy after green screen. Give her the Oscar for feeling distress at omens she can't even see on her flesh. Race feeling, that's a hangnail. They are everywhere to be found. Black pink of sun setting and the silhouettes that liberate white women from their mirrors. Melanin and feather strengthens them against wear. We, oh wear, the weirdest sisters IRL, and there, when her neck stretches into rope, lose yourself to your dark contrary in the mise en abyma of conquest. We think feeling is pink. Without black feeling, what is drama? Every genre of revelation is wearing my face. I am not imagining. I'm paying attention. What attention pays for has yet to be imagined. Um, thank y'all, and uh, happy birthday, happy 10th birthday, Adroit. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. And um, I don't know, can this reading get any better? And we're not done. Next up is Megan Giddings. Um, and Megan's short story appeared in issue 26. She is a visiting assistant professor at Michigan State University 
and work by Megan has been published by the Detroit Journal, the Iowa Review, the Southeast Review, and the Paris Review. Her first novel, Lakewood, was published in March of this past year, and her second novel, The Woman Could Fly, is forthcoming from Amistad. Please welcome Megan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me, and congratulations, Adroit. You all have been so good to me ever since you published me. I Thanks for having me here. So I'm going to read a flash story, hopefully very quickly. This is called The Alive Sister. This is supposed to be a story. It should have two black sisters playing in a park, one 12 and the other 10. They will both be playing with foam bats, an older woman, probably white, but I will wonder in revisions and even while I'm typing the word in the first draft, if I need to make that obvious, and is it too obvious or too little or too far, we'll call the police about the disturbance. And maybe I'll tell you why she does it because she doesn't want to watch two little black kids hit each other with bats and scream outside her window, or because she works at a factory and has a migraine, and really, she should quit the factory but has no skills and has to keep working at a place that sometimes grabs her in its metal fists and crunches her until all she can do is lie on the bathroom floor and ache for days, whatever. Or I won't tell you, and I'll let you think about why someone would do that. Police officers arrive, the girls miss it. They are running and yelling. They're in imagination land. Each of them is a giant, and they're fighting over who will be the next queen of giant land. The vanquished one will bring the victor candy cake and a golden crown that has you are the best engraved upon it. This is the final battle, the older girl yells and sees a golden unicorn. Its wings throw her. Then a police officer, for two stupid reasons that would make someone who thinks of herself as a good reader say in response, it seems like you are trying to make the villain a caricature rather than a real person, shoots one of the sisters. The 12 year old falls back in the leaves and the police officers don't check on her. They instead arrest the sister. The left alive sister learns rage or loneliness, definitely fear. She learns about life's swamp ugliness. Hate is an alligator pretending to be a log, ready to chomp you in half when you're calm and looking at it and thinking, what a boring piece of wood. She will know what her sister's eyes look like right before someone meant to protect them shot her. And maybe someone will blame her or her parents because why should kids have anything that look remotely like weapons? And then she'll learn what it means to be tired. And maybe, maybe I'll be able to write all this in a way where people say I am so removed and even keeled. I'll write in a way where someone just says, what an interesting story and feels no blame. And then I'll have to wonder if that makes the story a failure or a success. There is no clear medicine in this story, honey, or I'll keep going past the point you expect the story to end. Let the alive sister grow up and build a time machine. Maybe she'll sacrifice her older self for her sister, jump in front of the bullet, fade into time in front of her younger self, her older sister, and the two police officers. Maybe she'll go back and stop the police officers from ever being born. No, she won't be cruel and hurt their families. She'll just have their mothers meet better, handsomer guys. And maybe she'll go and live in the past, meet one of the police officers and insert herself in his life. She'll become his best friend, even though she'll always see the way he didn't even blink or consider, just saw Brown, just saw Bat and fired. So that when he comes back to that park, he'll pause because he actually once knew a girl who looked like those girls, like the way she laughed at his joke. Surprise, both sisters get to be the live sister. Or maybe the live sister will try to think of ways to go further. It's not enough to just make her life better. She'll analyze the best place to change things, try to find out who or what could have healed the hurt, try to figure out how people heal. Maybe in fiction, I'll find a way to let her have the answer. But I know that's impossible because if it was possible, I wouldn't be writing this story. Or maybe I'll let her set the time machine to self-destruct, take out the entire universe. And because sometimes I am a secret optimist, I'll let her reboot everything. The alive sister will see stars and planets be born. She'll be the only person, and it'll be lonely, and it'll be cold. But she'll build a home of nebulas and silence, and eventually, maybe, learn to leave the doors unlocked and the windows open. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was a beautiful reading and a wonderful story. Our next writer is from issue 30. 
Ben Lurie is the author of the collections, Tales of Falling and Flying and Stories for Nighttime and Some for the Day. His fables and tales have appeared in the New Yorker, Fairy Tale Review, Bomb Magazine, Wiggly, and a public space, and been heard on This American Life and selected shorts. He lives in Los Angeles and teaches short story writing at the UCLA Extension Writers Program. Ben, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. This is always the moment where it occurs to me I should have come up with some introductory remarks, um, but I didn't. So happy 10th anniversary to Detroit. I was really excited because I wanted to read my Joan of Arc story that was in Detroit. Um, and I sat down today to time it out. And of course, it turned out to be the longest story I've ever written in my life. So I'm not going to read that. Um, I decided to read something very short. Uh, this is a story that I published earlier this year, um, which is called, called God. All right. Um, God. Once there was a man who was tired of breathing. It's just such a drag, he said. So he decided to stop, but found that he couldn't. The air just kept going in and out. Hmm, said the man. He went to see a doctor. How do I stop breathing, he said. You don't, said the doctor, looking at him strangely. If you stopped breathing, you'd be dead. Dead, said the man. He went home and thought, he sat in the kitchen for a while. Well, he said, I guess I'll have to be dead. And he went and took the necessary steps. When he woke up in heaven, the man looked around. How did I get here, he said. He looked down and saw that his lungs were still pumping. This is exactly what I didn't want, he said. At that very moment, an angel came by. Excuse me, who's in charge here, the man said. God, said the angel and pointed to a hill. He lives right up there, the angel said. Oh, said the man, and what's this God like? The angel frowned, he scratched his halo a bit. Well, he said, he's definitely benevolent, but some might say he's a little strict. Strict, said the man. He walked up the hill, he knocked on the door of God's house. Coming, said a voice. The door opened. It was God. Yeah, what's the problem, God said. The problem, said the man, is that I'm still breathing. You don't like breathing, God said. And he reached out and grabbed the man in his hand and squeezed him. Is that better, he said. No, said the man, or at least tried to say. The problem was he couldn't say a word. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't even breathe. God's hand was so incredibly strong. Uh-oh, thought the man inside of his head as everything started to go black. And the consciousness of the man faded away to a point, and then the point flickered and went out. And God looked down at the man's body in his hand. Ugh, he said, and tossed it away. And he wiped his hands on the front of his pants and went back to watching TV. And meanwhile, outside, the man's body fell. Down it fell lifelessly through the clouds, and the wind whipped on past him, great gusts of wind. Then the wind went into his mouth. Oh, said the man as he came alive again, and suddenly it felt great to breathe. Wow, said the man, it's so great to be alive. Then he saw the ground rising up beneath. Oh, said the man, oh God, no, no, no. He squirmed and tried to grab hold of something. But of course there was nothing. He was plummeting through the air and eventually he started to laugh. Well, said the man, I guess that is that. He watched as the world came rushing up and he thought of his life now coming to an end. Well, this is unfortunate, he thought because suddenly the man's mind was crammed full of things, all the things that he had never done. He never climbed a mountain, never been to the Bronx. He never even learned how to sing. Well, thought the man, I guess mountains are out and the Bronx can't get there from here. And so somewhat shyly, the man cleared his throat and then he started to sing. 
He sang a little song he made up on the spot, just some lines about things he remembered, the people and places he'd known, dreams he'd had, different stories that people had told him. He sang about thoughts he'd had while driving in his car, about his best games down at the bowling alley. He sang about the girl he'd ask out in high school and also about the guy she'd married. He sang about his cat who got run over by a car. He sang about the shows on TV. He sang about ice cream and tapioca pudding. He sang about a hundred million things. The man sang arias and carols and hymns. He sang ballads and lullabies and rounds. The man sang pop songs, then country and blues. He found jazz and began to improvise. The man sang and sang and sang as he fell. And up in heaven, God watched it on TV. And after a while, God picked up the phone. He dialed a number and then let it ring. Yeah, God said when someone finally answered. You watching this, channel 40 million 12? I want to renew this guy for another season. Of course I'm sure, he said and hung up. And immediately down below, the man's descent slowed. He was at the point, he was at that point about to slam into the ground. And instead of barreling into it at top speed and dying, he landed daintily with both feet on the ground. Oh, said the man. He stood there wobbling a bit. Then his knees buckled and he sat down. He was sitting in a field. He put a hand to his chest. He was breathing quite rapidly in and out. It's okay, said the man, and gave a little laugh. That was an adventure, he said. And when he finally caught his breath, he stood and walked on home. And he started singing again, as he did. Thank you. That was, um, I, I feel like that story really hit it for, for where we are right now. At least it did for me. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, next up from issue 31, which was our January issue, is Victoria Chang's. And Victoria Chang's poetry books include Obit, Barbie Chang, The Boss, Salvinia and Molesta, and Circle. Her children's books are Is Mommy, illustrated by Marla Frazé, and Love Love, a middle grade novel. She lives in Los Angeles and serves as the program chair of Antioch's Low Residency MFA program. And I will add that Obit is racking up recognition everywhere. Welcome, Victoria. Thank you. And, um, you know, uh, for accessibility, I'm going to pop, let's see, my poems in the chat as well. If you have trouble seeing it or opening it, just um, let me know. I'm just going to read um, three poems. Uh, first, I want to thank Peter and um, Heidi and everyone who has a hand in Adroit. Sounds like there are hundreds of people possibly involved with Adroit, and I don't doubt that to be the case. Happy anniversary. Um, I, I, can, I can't actually imagine how much work goes into even making one issue. So congratulations. It really is uh, an incredible journal that it was wonderful right away. So I'm so happy to be a part of it and uh, excited to be a part of this reading. Um, okay, <laughs> everyone's yaying and welcoming me. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so I'm gonna read three poems and um, they're all in these little obituary shapes and there's really nothing you need to know except uh, my mom passed away of pulmonary fibrosis uh, maybe in uh, 2015. And it's just when your lungs sort of harden and you suffocate to death. Um, this one is called Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deads. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The text kept interrupting my grief. 
forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. Um, so I don't know if anyone here has dentures or if you know someone who has dentures. Um, I don't even know if people have dentures. I mean, well, of course they have dentures, I'm sure. My mother had dentures. And so um, what it means is that they're all growing up, there are teeth everywhere, um, lying on tables, in glasses with various um, fizzy things and multiple teeth everywhere. So this one's called my mother's teeth. My mother's teeth died twice, once in 1965, all pulled out from gum disease. Once again, on August 3rd, 2015, the fake teeth sit in a box in the garage. When she died, I touched them, smelled them, thought I heard a whimper. I shoved the teeth into my mouth, but having two sets of teeth only made me hungrier. When my mother died, I saw myself in the mirror, her words around my mouth, like powder from a donut. Her last words were in English. She asked for a Sprite. I wonder whether her last thought was in Chinese. I wonder what her last thought was. I used to think that a dead person's words die with them. Now I know that they scatter, looking for meaning to attach to, like a scent. My mother used to collect orange blossoms in a small, shallow bowl. I passed the tree each spring, I always knew that grief was something I could smell, but I didn't know that it's not actually a noun, but a verb, that it moves. I'll read one more. Um, I was listening to NPR one day and this uh, person, a scientist actually with Alzheimer's um, was trying to explain how to draw a clock. Actually, why he could no longer figure out how to draw a clock. The clock died on June 24th, 2009, and it was untimely. How many times my father has failed the clock test? Once I heard a scientist with Alzheimer's on the radio trying to figure out why he could no longer draw a clock. It had to do with the superposition of three types. The hours represented by one to 12, the minutes where one no longer represents one, but five, and a two now represents 10, then the second hand that measures one to 60. I sat at the stoplight and thought of the clock, its perfect circle and its superpositions, all the layers of complication on a plane of thought, yet the healthy read the clock in one single instant without a second thought. I think about my father and his lack of first thoughts, how every thought is a second or third or fourth thought, unable to locate the first most important thought. I wonder about the man on the radio and how far his brain has degenerated since. Marvel at how far brains allow language to wander without looking back but knowing where the peer is. If you unfold an origami swan and flatten the paper, is the paper sad because it has seen the shape of the swan or does it aspire toward toward flatness, a life without creases. My father is the paper. He remembers the swan, but can't name it. He no longer knows the paper swan represents an animal swan. His brain is the water the animal swan once swam in, holds everything, but when thawed, all the fish disappear. Most of the words we say have something to do with fish, and when they're gone, they're gone. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Absolutely beautiful and poignant, um, now and always. And finally, from issue 33 of the Adroit Journal that came out last May, Arthur C. Arthur C.'s 10th book of poetry, Sightlines, received the 2019 National Book Award for Poetry. His new and collected poems, The Glass Constellation, is forthcoming from Copper Canyon Press in April 2021. Thank you, Arthur, for joining us tonight. We're honored.
Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. I also want to thank Peter and Heidi and everyone associated with a joint journal for 10 years. It's really fantastic. And let me say, keep going too. Can't wait to see how uh, the magazine evolves and it's just so wonderful. It's such a pleasure to be reading with everyone this evening. I also am going to read uh, three poems. First, Snow. A rabbit has stopped on the gravel driveway, imbibing the silence you stare at spruce needles. There's no sound of a leaf blower, no sign of a black bear. A few weeks ago, a buck scraped his rack against an aspen trunk. A carpenter scribed a plank along a curved stone wall. You only spot the rabbit's ears and tail. When it moves, you locate it against speckled gravel. But when it stops, it blends in again. The world of being is like this gravel. You think you own a car, a house, this blue zigzag shirt, but you just borrow these things. Yesterday, you constructed an aqueduct of dreams and stood at Gibraltar, but you possess nothing. Snow melts into a pool of clear water. And in this stillness, starlight behind daylight, wherever you gaze. And this next poem appeared in uh, a joint journal, uh, as Heidi said, in May. It's called Oasis. A tiny spider crawls across the lit screen of a laptop. What does it make of the world? Men chisel flagstone and form a stepped patio. Soon, a for sale sign will hang at the street. Sleeping on my back, I snore, then turn to my side. In the morning, you hum before showering. In the afternoon, long lines of rain vanish before striking the ground. But we are not distraught. A black morel rises in a garden. Orange blossoming daylilies arc near a half spherical stone fountain. Water murmurs in the basin before it spills over the edge. Before morning spills over the edge, sunrise makes lakes between clouds. And this last poem is in an invented form. I, wanted to experiment with repetition, but rather than like have the same word at the beginning of each line where it becomes predictable, I just give myself the stricture of saying uh, what would happen, or asking myself what would happen if each line picked up a word or word from the previous lines, and that includes the title. So here it is, The White Orchard. Under a supermoon, you gaze into the orchard. A glass blower shapes a glowing orange mass into a horse. You step into a space where you once lived. Crushed mica glitters on plastered walls. A raccoon strolls in moonlight along the top of an adobe wall. Swimming in a pond, we notice a reflected cottonwood on the water. Clang, a deer leaps over the gate. Every 15 minutes, an elephant is shot for its tusks. You mark a bleached earless lizard against the snowfall of this white page the skins of eggplants glistening in a garden, or bodies glistening by firelight. Those skunks once ravaged corn or bright moments cannot be ravaged. 
sleeping near a canal, you hear lapping waves. At dawn, waves lapping and the noise of men unloading scallops and shrimp. No noise of gunshots. You focus on the branches of hundred year old apple trees. Opening the door, we find red and yellow rose petals scattered on our bed. Then light years. You see pear branches farther in the orchard as the moon rises. Branches bending under the snow of this white page. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful way to end a very special reading. And now I'd like to thank all of our contributors who read tonight. Um, we are so fortunate to have your support and your work. Thank you for sharing. And thank you to our staff who shows up every day to make the Adroit Journal possible and to our millions of readers, millions of readers, <laughs> it's amazing. And to you for sharing in our celebration. And thank you to Peter for having this dream when he was 15. I'd also like to encourage other poets with dreams and those without collections to consider submitting to our Dijikian Scholars Prize. Um, the link is in the chat and we are reading now. Now let's all unmute and celebrate with some noise, okay? Let's hear and clap, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank so you. Wonderful. Bravo. Bravo. Thank Bravo. you so much. Thank you.